when Millet was running for office, he made a lot of signs that he has very authoritarian tendencies. I mean, like many of these so-called libertarians do. Again, Pinochet is the first really, real, really existing libertarianism. And uh, also a lot of Millet supporters are Pinochet apologists. And he's allied with Jose Antonio Cast, who is the literal Pinochet supporter in Chile, who was the last presidential candidate in the previous election. He nearly won the election. He's close personal friends with Millet. He attended Millet's inauguration. They've been photographed together. Millet publicly supports him. Jose Antonio Cast in neighboring Chile, for people who don't know, he was a Pinochet youth member. He grew up supporting Pinochet. His, he comes from a family of Nazi, not literal Nazis, who after World War II, they went to Chile. Mm -hmm. You know, there's all this, you know, this, these jokes about all the Nazis who fled to Argentina. Well, actually, the country in the Americas that took the most Nazis after World War II was actually the United States through Operation mm. Paperclip. But of course, there were Nazis who went to Argentina. There were also a lot of Nazis who went to Chile, and many of them actually supported Pinochet, and some of them were actually involved in his regime, including the famous Colonia Dignidad. I won't mention this because you'll be instantly demonetized, but all we can say is that there it was it was this prison colony run by Nazis who used slave labor. And they also were engaged in massive abuse of children, systematic abuse of children. And why does that Paul provoke demonetization? Why does that provoke demonetization? Well, because if I talk about like what they were doing to children, like uh, oh, I um, see. like these these Nazis yeah. in Chile in Colonia, just people should look up Colonia Dignidad. And the guy, the current Pinochet supporter in Chile, who will probably be the next president, Jose Antonio Cast comes from a family of Nazis. He is a youth member of the, the youth league that supported Pinochet, and he's still an unapologetic supporter of Pinochet. So the Latin American right, I mean, like they're really fascistic. And, and Millet is allied with all of these people. So even though his economic program is explicitly neoliberal and libertarian, his, again, he combines this kind of social conservatism. He's against abortion. So a libertarian who wants to illegalize abortion. So for context, recently, a few years ago, Argentina, under the kind of center-left Peronist government, they actually legalized abortion. And he now says he want, he campaigned promising he wants to legalize, illegalize, make it illegal, abortion. And didn't he didn't he say that he supports your ability to sell a child? That's how commit, committed he is to the idea of markets? Yeah, well, he was asked about that, and he said that he would consider it. He's open to the idea of allowing what he calls a free market of children. And he says that this would solve the problem of orphans, of orphans who aren't wanted for adoption, because if you let the free market sell the children, then therefore, you know, that, that's that's his solution. Now, to be fair, he hasn't talked about that since winning, although he did say he would be interested in it. And that idea comes from Murray Rothbard, who is the original anarcho-capitalist who inspires Millet. Millet has invoked Murray Rothbard. And by the way, Murray Rothbard started as an ANCAP and he later became a fascist, not, not so fun historical fact. And he made an alliance with the KKK, Murray Rothbard. Um, and he, he called for like this libertarian far right alliance. And this was like back in the 80s and 90s. So anyway, this this is what we're seeing today. And, you know, Bolsonaro is another example of this in Brazil. Bolsonaro is also a close personal friend of Millet. And Bolsonaro's economic minister, Paulo Guedes, was also such a big fan of Pinochet that he moved from Brazil to Chile under Pinochet in order to teach economics because he loved Pinochet and he was an advisor to the Pinochet regime. So again, when we're talking about libertarianism in Latin America, that's associated with literally the most infamous fascist dictator in the region. Anyway, getting back to your question on, on Millet and the protests. So during mm -hmm. his campaign, Millet said that he wanted to massively expand police, not very libertarian of him. He said he wanted to expand police budgets and he wanted to build for-profit private prisons, which I mean, it sounds like a dystopia, but actually the U.S., of course, we know has right. private prisons. And he, in his campaign program that he released that apparently journalists are incapable of reading. I mean, it's in Spanish, but you can get a translator. Um, anyway, the point is, is that in his political program, before he was running for office from his party, which is La Libertad Avanza, Liberty Advances, he said that he wanted to create private prisons and he wanted to create a national face surveillance program where he puts cameras all across the country and creates a, a national system of facial recognition to track down all criminals. And he says he wanted to reduce the age of being, uh, to reduce the age of being considered an adult. And what's funny is a lot of people joked, okay, well, not surprising to hear 
a libertarian wanted to reduce the age of consent or to reduce the age of being considered an adult. He didn't do it in the context of being a minor, but obviously he wants to reduce it from age 18 to, to lower, which would also make pederasty legal. So we might, well, he might actually he want to do it to make it, it I mean, easier you're saying for, that it's not be yeah. Well, well, when he mentioned the idea, it was not in the context of, you know, pedophilia. It was in the uh -huh. context of being able, making it easier to imprison teenagers who steal. Jesus Christ. So he, his whole thing is that we have too much crime. We have too many young people who steal, which tends to happen when you have high rates of poverty and inflation. So instead of dealing with poverty, his solution is to reduce the age of being considered an adult. So 15 year olds who steal some stuff from a store can be thrown in prison and tr tried like an adult. So it was not surprising. I mean, during his campaign, he made it clear he would do this. And since coming in, he immediately moved to, to legalize protest. He also moved to take away power from Congress to concentrate power because he doesn't have a majority in the Congress. His, his political party and his allies only have a minority. So he tried to pass policies to take away power from Congress by declaring a state of emergency, which would allow him to push through executive orders to mass privatize everything and sell off everything and cut. You know, he's already fired 70,000 public workers and mm -hmm. and has his goals of firing many more. And at the same time, we've seen these massive protests. He basically made them illegal. And he passed a law saying that if you are caught protesting, the police will film you. And then if you're not imprisoned, they will send you a a um, a ticket to your house charging you for public disorder. So it's now illegal to protest. If you're not thrown in prison, you will be fined by the state. Very libertarian. And furthermore, one of his political allies in Congress, famously a lawmaker, made this famous public speech in which he said he told protesters, you have two options, prison or the bullet, carcero la bala, prison or the bullet. Okay. Um, so it sounds like it's getting a little bit uh, dicey for the people of Argentina. I mean, what are what is the political attitude on the ground right now? You mentioned that there were sort of specific circumstances that limited options in the last election that contributed to Malay being able to win. Is the expectation that those same continued circumstances are going to ensure that he has a long political career? Or is the level of discontent in the country sufficient that it's unlikely that he'll last more than his term? Well, Argentina doesn't necessarily have a history of as much political instability as countries like Ecuador, for instance, where it's very common for presidents not to finish their term. So who knows if, if Millet will finish his term, but I, I think it's quite likely he will not have another term after this. I mean, it's mm -hmm. going to be a disaster. It has been a disaster. All the signs are showing it's going to get, keep getting worse. I haven't even mentioned, by the way, the extreme deindustrialization going on. Because what happens Please, I did, I did when you, that. Yeah, because what happens is when you have these mass privatizations, when the infrastructure is being destroyed, because he's he's just I mean, he's firing everyone who make maintains roads, builds roads, builds railroads. You need this infrastructure in order to export products. So they're seeing extreme deindustrialization. And also the government had support for some certain industries. So, I mean, we're seeing the complete destruction of the economy. This is actually not the first time it's happened in Argentina, by the way. Um, in fact, one of the reasons that Millet became a libertarian is, is because when he grew up as a child, as a teenager, there was a similar hyperinflation process that was overseen by another neoliberal president whose solution was also dollarization and his solution was what we're going to do is create a, a peg, a currency peg, and say that the peso is is backed by this number of dollars at a set rate. And then when you run out of dollars, your currency completely is meaning is valueless. So immediately there is hyperinflation. So th this is this has been tried before. It's failed every time. This is going to be the third time that Argentina dollarizes, and every single time it ended in a massive explosion of hyperinflation. The question is how long. Millet can hold on. He's asking for a $15 billion loan from the IMF, and they will probably give it to him because the IMF loves him, of course, because the IMF has imposed these kinds of programs on countries for decades. And the IMF is, of course, basically run by the US. The US is the only country in the world that has veto power. But anyway, the point is, is that his gamble now is to take on a huge loan and then use those dollars to dollarize. 
And then when he runs out of dollars, well, maybe he'll be out of office by then. But anyway, the point is, is getting back to when he, what, what will happen and what happened in this past election. The problem in Argentina is a problem in many countries. The left has been really devastated. There's not much of a left alternative. Now, Argentina has a unique history because it did have a, a very famous leftist leader who was a very complicated figure, but Juan Perón. And he was basically a kind of progressive nationalist social democrat who was pro-labor, at least at the beginning. It's a complicated story. Argentine, Argentine politics are complicated. But the point is, is that Perón came in as like a pro-labor leader. He was also very nationalist. He wanted to be independent from the U.S., and by the way, one of the reasons that Argentina has this stereotype of being like infiltrated by Nazis is because the State Department was using this as a way of demonizing Perón when he was in office because mm -hmm. he was very independent. I'm not saying that like, obviously there are criticisms of Perón. It's very, Argentina is complicated. I'm not down, there are definitely Nazis who went to Argentina, but like I said, the, there were many Nazis who went to Chile, to Brazil, to Bolivia, and the US took the most Nazis through Operation Paperclip. But anyway, the point is, is Perón had this, program where basically he wanted to massively industrialize Argentina. He did so through massive state investment, massive state-led developmentalism. This was also true in Brazil at the time, before the neoliberal era. And he, and, and then his wife subsequently, Evita Peron, you know, there's this famous musical, Don't Cry For Me, Argentina, you know, you know. I'm already plotting know. that that's maybe the outro music of this episode. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, and Evita came from a humble working class background. She was seen as, you know, the voice of the, the underclass. So per Peronism comes, it's named after Juan Peron, Evita Peron. There's like this history there and it's left. It's not communist. Certainly they were anti-communist, but they're also, anyway, it's complicated. So then what happened later on is in the 1980s, you had some neoliberals who tried to adopt kind of this, this kind of nationalist Peronism, but combine it with the Washington consensus. And then you mm. get the hyperinflation crisis. And um, anyway, whatever. So at least well, it's today. So pause there just just for a second. What what is the root cause of the hyperinflation crisis that predates Malay? And that seems to be the justification for electing people like Malay. And frankly, maybe the maybe the justification for reelecting Donald Trump in the United States. I mean, this is obviously this idea of out of control inflation is a real driver. And so what was going on in Argentina and why, you know, what alternative policies it's perhaps worth talking about to what Malay is presenting might be able to bring it under control? Yeah, well, good question. In the case of U.S. inflation, it's very different. One, because the U.S. dollar is the global reserve currency. So the U.S. can export its inflation, which it does. I mean, the Federal Reserve has printed trillions of dollars in the past 20 years through quantitative easing. And anyway, it's complicated. Uh, that, that's not the important point because the U.S. is a very special case. Argentina is not a special case. There are, in fact, many global South countries that have dealt with these kinds of problems. And it's pretty easy to explain, actually. So Argentina is a country that has struggled a lot with a trade deficit. So it often imports much more than it exports because it doesn't produce a lot. And mm -hmm. this is a problem that many global South countries face. They want to industrialize. One, because it provides good jobs for people. Now the U.S. is trying to reindustrialize and the U.S. is spending trillions of dollars to do it, by the way, through the Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act. And the U.S. is exporting that inflation around the world because it can simply print dollars. Argentina, if it tries to print more pesos to implement industrial policy like the U.S. does, it can't do that perpetually because eventually you'll have extreme inflation. So Argentina has dealt with this issue of having not enough industry, which means it's very dependent on importing foreign capital goods, technologies, cars, machine parts, all of that, phones, TVs, computers, it imports all of it. And what does Argentina produce? Well, soy, corn, wheat, it has a little energy, not a lot, mostly commodities, raw materials, agricultural products, like many global South countries. This is in fact why one of the most famous development economists in history, was an Argentine economist, Raul Previch, who was the founder of the UN Conference on Trade and Development, which is like the global South think tank, economic think tank at the UN. And Argentina has this history, going back to Perón, of like this very progressive developmentalism, global South oriented state led economic development, which was very successful until the neoliberal era. And then all these countries started getting trapped in debt. So they, they also import a lot of oil, they import gas, so when you have to import these products, how do you pay for it? 
well, the U.S. can print the dollars. So it used to take a few pennies for the U.S. to print a hundred dollar bill. Now, most of the money that exists in the world is not physical. It's just numbers on a computer screen. So the U.S. can can print more and more money digitally and import as much as it wants, which is why the U.S. has literally hundreds of billions of dollars of a trade deficit. It's like $800 billion now. Any other country in the world that did that would face hyperinflation. The U.S. doesn't because it can simply print the money and export its inflation. So Argentina, like a lot of Global South countries, they rely on importing a lot, which means they often have a current account deficit. And that means that over time, their currency tends to depreciate against the dollar because they need to get access to dollars to pay for the imports of oil, of gas, of other food, of technology, of machine parts, of capital goods. So Millet's solution is completely destroy the purchasing power of people in Argentina. They will no longer buy food. They certainly won't buy phones. They certainly won't buy TVs and computers. And then there will be very few imports. And then our current account will balance out. And yeah, our, our industry will be destroyed, but at least we no longer have a deficit. This is the way he sees the world. And and does he think that over that that's like a short term harm? And then at some point be, there, there's an upswing. I mean, what is what's the end game there of immiserating the entire public? Is it just, oh, you know, buckle, tighten your belts for a year, but then things will normalize? Yeah. I mean, in, in his inauguration speech, what's funny is it's actually one of the most pessimistic inauguration speeches I've ever seen. He literally said very hard times are coming. And he said there is no alternative to the shock. That's the famous quote. It's a mixture of, you know, Margaret Thatcher, there is no alternative to neoliberalism and mm -hmm. the shock therapy, the shock doctrine, right? He literally said mm -hmm. there, quote, there is no alternative to the shock. And he is he's referred to this austerity package that he says is tightening your belt. We have to go through this pain because we're living beyond our means. This is what they always say. We're living beyond our means. And he's saying that, yes, you'll have hyperinflation. Your purchasing power will be destroyed, but that's because you're living beyond your means. But in reality, I mean, it's this is a problem that many Global South countries face. This is why, for instance, Sri Lanka just did its 16th bailout from the IMF because Sri Lanka mm -hmm. doesn't really produce that much except for agricultural products. And it imports all of its technology, all of its capital goods, and all of its oil. Pakistan, the exact same thing. I mean, there's there's a reason that many of these Global South countries are literally now, in the case of Sri Lanka, going through a 16th bailout from the IMF because the system is designed in a way with the US dollar at its heart, so the US benefits from this, where Global South countries have to get access to US dollars. They have to continue exporting their guts out. They have to sell more and more agricultural products at lower and lower prices to get access to the hard currencies they need in order to pay for their imports. And it's just an unsustainable system. Eventually they run out of dollars, especially with corruption, which is obviously often rampant in many of these countries. And then when they run out of dollars, they say, IMF, we need, we need dollars, please give us dollars. And the IMF says, okay, but in return, you have to privatize all of your state-owned companies. You have to drop the minimum wage. You have to cut health care. Argentina is not unique in that case, but also in the case of Argentina, you have extreme corruption. I mean, this is a real thing. And of course, we have it in the U.S. as well. I mean, with insider trading and all of this, but in, in Argentina, it's more explosive because they can't print their way out of these problems. And in the case of Argentina, for instance, there was a previous right-wing president Mauricio Macri, who was like a more traditional kind of, you know, uh, George Bush kind of, you know, right winger, he, not like a so-called populist. And what's funny, though, is Mauricio Macri, this, you know, conventional right winger, his finance minister is now under Millet, the, the same. He's now the economic minister. His name is Luis Caputo. And what's his background? He worked for J.P. Morgan. He oversaw mm -hmm. J.P. Morgan's Latin America trading. He worked for Deutsche Bank, overseeing their Latin America trading, and he worked at the World Bank. I mean, so the same neoliberal ghouls who were in power before have been brought back by Millet, implementing the same programs, but even more extreme. And by the way, why does Argentina have so much debt with the IMF? Where did that come from? It didn't come from the left. In fact, the left paid off the debt. Famously, mm -hmm. it was the leftist Nestor Kirchner, who was a left-wing Peronist. He was the president that came to power in the 2000s, very progressive. He, he used the foreign exchange reserves of Argentina to famously pay off all the IMF debt. And he said, we will never borrow again from the IMF. And then his wife, he died and his wife yeah. became president. 
um, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, and they were leftists, known as the Kirchneristas, who were left-wing Peronists, and you know, very you know, social democratic, socialist oriented, and they refused to take money from the IMF. They did not. They were not the ones who took the debt. It was the right wing, Mauricio Macri, who took the biggest IMF loan in history, over fifty billion dollars. And then what happened with that mm -hmm. money? That money was used to stabilize the currency, and all of his friends sold all of their peso assets. They stashed their wealth in dollars and offshore bank accounts. And then there was inflation again. So the inflation crisis did not start with the left. There's this idea that Argentina is socialist. The inflation started under Mauricio Macri, and then they were trapped in all of this debt. So then Mauricio Macri lost the election because he caused this inflation crisis. But what happened, this is also a problem of the, the weakness of the left. In the second last election, what happened is that the candidate who represented a very big tent Peronist party was Alberto Fernandez, who calling him inspiring would be like the biggest compliment in world history. I mean, this is like a, the most milquetoast centrist politician you can imagine. <laughs> he was very unpopular, but he was seen as a unifying candidate because of all the media propaganda that portrayed the Kirchners as corrupt, even though it's not true. It's mm -hmm. part of this lawfare campaign in the media propaganda, but they Eventually, if you say it enough, the lie sticks. They say, you're corrupt, you're corrupt. There's no proof of it, but this, eventually it sticks. And then the Kirchneristas were afraid of being seen as too controversial. So they picked this very centrist candidate that no one had very strong feelings about, Alberto Fernandez. And he became the president. And then Cristina became the vice president. But in reality, when they came into power, she was pushed aside. And Alberto ended up trying to be more... He, he wanted to actually exercise power, even though everyone knew the agreement was he was supposed to kind of sit back and share power. He refused to. He pushed out a lot of the ministers that were appointed by Cristina early on. They were publicly fighting, even though, can you imagine the vice president and president publicly fighting? So it was a Gosh, disaster. It's what makes my dreams. <laughs> yeah, and then one final note here. One final note is that, so I mentioned that Cristina was not allowed to run. She was going to run mm -hmm. again for president, but she was prevented by the corrupt judiciary. And the judge, by the way, who ruled that she was corrupt, he was filmed and photographed with the some of the billionaires who own the media going to the south of Argentina to their vacation home. This is the judge who oversaw the case. Mm. I mean, it's blatantly cartoonishly corrupt. Yeah, I mean, the, the more you describe, the more it sounds, there's echoes of familiarity. The yeah. um, pushing aside of a popular progressive candidate for a, an inspiring milquetoast neoliberal, um, the rank corruption that just gets yada, yada, yada away, whether it's um, all of the corruption scandals with the Supreme Court that we've observed from the flags to the Clarence Thomases and the trailers or whatever he got purchased. His corruption was so silly, too. I think he got RV, like a, yeah. An RV, like who is, okay, so easily bribed, at least ask for something good. Um, but I, I wanted to come back to, to uh, the, the Kirchner's. Is it? One final note, sorry, I know I'm putting throwing a lot of information out there, but this is important. So sure. so I mentioned that Christina was not allowed to run. So who was the candidate who ran against Millet? It was the worst possible candidate. It was mm. the economic minister under Alberto Fernandez. His name is Sergio Massa who was the right wing of the Peronist coalition. I mean, you could say he's a centrist, he's really center right. He was the mm -hmm. economic minister. And originally when they made the deal, they had this big tent Peronist coalition of the left wing Peronists, the centrists like Fernandez and the right wing Peronists like Sergio Massa. And Sergio Massa was made the head of the Congress. Alberto Fernandez was president and Cristina was vice president. However, what happened is Cristina was pushed aside Alberto was a disaster. He, he decided he wasn't even going to run. So then Sergio Massa was the candidate. He was literally the representative of the IMF because when they came into office, famously, Cristina said, we will not pay a cent to the IMF. This loan that was taken is illegitimate. And it was later exposed by Donald Trump's former appointee to the World Bank. His name is Mauricio Claver Carone. He did an interview with the Argentine media in which he revealed that Donald Trump ordered the IMF to give the biggest loan in history to Argentina, to Macri, before the election in order to help Macri try to stabilize the currency before the election so Macri could say, look, I've stabilized the economy, vote for me. So the IMF was quite literally 
at U.S. orders, was meddling in Argentina's democracy. Mm. And then all that money went to, to funding, you know, just c- corruption. They're caught with, they're trapped with all this debt. So then when Cristina and, and Alberto came in, they said, Cristina said, we should not pay a single dollar. She got pushed aside. And what happened? Alberto obediently kneeled down and he negotiated with the IMF a new package, a new, not mm. more money, but how to pay off the money. So the economist who negotiated with the IMF against the wishes of Cristina was the candidate running against Millet. Why would mm. anyone vote for him? I mean, so mm. this just shows that, again, when you don't have an actual option, when you have the, the centrist neoliberal establishment versus this far right candidate who portrays himself as populist and Millet claimed that he was going to fight against all the bastard politicians. He called them all bastards. And I, I'm going to do something different. People said, well, let's try something different, which is what they sure. did with Brexit. It's what they did with Trump. And then he comes in and he brings in the same people who ran the the mockery regime. They're brought in just like Trump brought in all of Bush's ghouls. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash podcast. That's patreon.com slash podcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.